well, I have lots to work on. And, and here I thought I've been in therapy for five and a half years. I should be good to go. But clearly there's still, of course, making sure that I have my own back, making some clear values, what I'm expecting out of men that I want to date, being more specific with some of that. Well, there's quite a bit with the trust and mistrust and the fear of abandonment and emotional deprivation, stuff like that. Those are all things that I can work on, you know, that are tangible things that I can do. This is episode number 598. We are almost 600 episodes into this podcast in our 11th season. And I'm so excited today because I am doing another live coaching session with a stranger. Um, I don't know Beth. She contacted me to be able to be coached on the show. And I am really excited to talk to her. We're going to be talking about what type of work people need in order to find love, to have a good relationship. And it's a fantastic question. We're going to learn more about Beth in just a minute. But in the meantime, I just wanted to welcome you back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go in your last first date. I am Sandy Weiner, and I've written two books to support you on your journey to lasting love. The first one is Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. This book was written because I saw so many people who really didn't know their worth and didn't really value themselves enough. And I think one of the first steps in doing the work is knowing your value, knowing your values. And there's so much in this book, many, many exercises, 30 of them, in fact, and lots of stories and even interviews from my podcast. The second book is Choice Points in Dating. And this book was written because so many people feel they don't have choices, that we're kind of born this way, or we don't really know how to date, who to date. Um, you know, we have choices along the way, how, how long to stay. That's something we're going to actually be covering today. How long do you stay in a relationship? When is it time to go? And how do you know it's your last first date? Both of these books are available on Amazon for Kindle and paperback. And uh, today's tip on becoming a woman of value is step number five, which is own your beauty. Everybody has a different type of beauty, but many of us don't feel beautiful, especially as we age and we start looking at little wrinkles and flaws and sagginess and all kinds of things that happen. But the honest truth is that we are beautiful at every stage and every age, and we often miss the opportunity to really value the beauty that we have. We look back five years later and go, wow, I wish I could have appreciated how beautiful I was then. I remember finding pictures that a friend of mine had taken, Polaroid pictures, actually, that's how long ago it was, when we were probably <laughs> 20, and they were gorgeous. Like, I did not think I had a good body then, and I look back and I go, oh my God, our bodies were amazing, and we did not appreciate them. And so appreciate every stage, appreciate your beauty. Before I bring on Beth, I just want to invite you to join my Facebook group. Beth is a member. It's called Your Last First Date. And we are a unique group. I think Beth will agree. There are so many groups out there that, God, I mean, I'm a member of many of them. And it's like, look at how these men are horrible. Oh, could you believe this? And they'll post screenshots of conversations and, and their profiles. And it's just like a hate on men fest. And that isn't going to help you find love, in my opinion. <laughs> what will help you is clear guidance, boundaries, ways to grow. Uh, I'm live in the group every single weekend. I post so many things in this group. Plus, we have amazing monitors who keep this group safe and sane and also post daily. And it's just a really highly engaging group. So join us at your last first date. And now for my guest, Beth. Beth, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. I'm excited to, to be here. <laughs> well, I'm excited that yeah. you were brave enough to write in yeah. and, to, um, and to answer the call for guests. I, I love coaching live on the show. Uh, we've never met. And so this right. is all new to me. So tell us. And me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Tell us uh, how old you are, what's okay. your relationship status, why sure. did you write into the show? Okay, well, I am 54 years old, and my relationship status is, it's complicated. <laughs> um, no, I have been divorced for about five and a half years now, and I've had two very long-term relationships that ended poorly. Um, as you, you know, have taught, you learn a lesson from each one and I've taken it on to the next. I've had many short-term relationships that kind of just fizzled out. Um, but this last round of dating, I um, really wanted to have dating with intention. And so I really had some qualities that I wanted men to have values, you know, similar to mine. And if it didn't work out, I would just, you know, end it right there. Whereas in the past, I would be like, oh, he's nice. He's got this quality, this quality and go on from there. Um, so I really made a point to do it with intention, what I thought. So I did find a, a gentleman with similar values, a very nice man, kind, great communicator, um, just good quality. And the attraction was minimal. And, you know, I, I've always had relationships in the past where it was like on fire, that chemistry where it was just, it was hot. And, um, as you know, not always a great sign when it's like that, it, it can mean some other things might be going on. So I, I'm aware of that now. So I said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to go through the process and I'm going to really get to know this man and keep it more of on a friendship type basis until I'm sure. And, um, it did grow a little bit, um, but it never really got to the point where I feel like I want to just be with him for the rest of my life. And so I did break things off with him, but I am now really having some hesitancy since I've broken it off. I have just, it's not so much just this intense feeling of, I, not only do I miss him, but it's, I feel like I don't, I'm not sure exactly how to, to tell all what I feel, but it's not so much because I'm lonely. I have a very fulfilling life, great friends and great activities. And I, I'm okay being by myself. So I feel like I'm at a good place for dating, but, um, I did break things off. So then, you know, did I do it, uh, be too quickly? I mean, is this something that could grow because he's such a good man? Um, one of his biggest things for me was he's, he's very overweight and I'm a very healthy, conscious person. So it's, it's something that's not attractive to me. So I really thought that I could get over it, but it kept being a point for me that was an issue. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I do see a therapist and, you know, I've discussed this with him and he, you know, he keeps saying, well, maybe you just need some time without dating, you know, to work on you. And, and, you know, you can always work on you. I feel like there's always something you can improve, but at the same time, okay, well, I've been in therapy since my divorce. So what else can I do? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. So thanks for sharing all of that. Sure. I have a lot yeah. of questions. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, so we're going to talk about all the all the things that you mentioned, but let's. I wanted to back up a little bit when you said the other shorter, the other long term relationships ended poorly. Mm -hmm. What what did that look like? One of them, he um, was a chronic liar, just habitual liar, and I didn't find out until about a year and a half in that every single thing that he told me was a lie. So it, um, and I truly love that man. <laughs> so it was crushing. Um, honestly, that was the hardest breakup that I've had in my life, even over my 24 year marriage. Um, the other, the other long-term relationship, it was just, he was, he was very avoidant and he had some very unhealthy boundaries with his ex-wife, um, that kept causing issues after issues. So we would break up 
And then he'd say, no, I'll, I'll make these changes. And he'd make the changes for a little bit and then he'd slip back in. So it just kept going and kept going. So we eventually did break up, but it was about a two and a half year relationship. And, um, you know, it, it was something I've learned a lot from, you know, that was my very first relationship after my divorce. Um, and he kind of helped me through that whole divorce process and what to expect. Um, so I, I, you know, each one of them were good men and I appreciate the lessons learned. They just weren't the right ones. Well, the first one chronic liar took a year and a half for you to learn that. How, how did you find that out? Because he had a brain tumor, I'm, I'm a nurse. So I, um, worked with him to get this taken care of, get a, a nurse surgeon. And he went and actually had a craniotomy where it was removed. And I do honestly believe during that process, he lost the ability to lie <laughs> and it came out. Um, and then it just kept going back and forth. And I found out through his mother that most everything he told me was a lie and he I to give him you know the benefit of the doubt I'm hopeful it was the tumor causing that as it was in the frontal lobe which controls that type of behavior um but I don't know I mean he could have very well been a sociopath my question is do you have a tendency to give a lot of chances to people <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, I am very much a people pleaser and believe people do have the right to have a second chance. So definitely. And I've always had trouble with boundaries. It's something I continue to work on setting boundaries and knowing it's to protect me, not being rude. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So part of this is the work is the learning the difference between being kind to people and being a doormat, being kind and giving too many chances. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm feeling like the giving too many chances is coming up again with this new man, because you were pretty clear that this wasn't working. One of your values is health and he is not healthy. So that brings me to your must have list what is on it? I really am looking for somebody with integrity, you know, who is going to do good no matter what. And also, you know, I've never, I feel like I've never had anyone, any man in my life that I felt secure enough with who I felt like had my back. And that's ultimately what I'm looking for. Somebody who is an honest man um, is one of the biggest, but there's also, you know, I do have other, of course, you know, superficial ones. I, I really, it's, it's important to me to have somebody who's healthy and who has similar beliefs in that, you know, we're in control of that. Yes, we, we age and stuff, but we can do it gracefully and we can do it to prolong our lives as opposed to, you know, being gluttonous, I guess, would be the best way to say it. You know, it's it's just not an appealing trait to me. So it's something that's, it's hard because I feel there's so much more to a person than their physical looks. So I I struggle with that, with, with him, because I've never given him the chance to say, hey, yeah, you're right, Beth. I, I, I could do some work on that. So, you know, that's not fair either. He doesn't even really understand the real reason, you know? But what did you tell him when you ended it? You know, at this stage, I feel like my, I should have deeper feelings for you and it's not there yet. Um, but my therapist said, you know, you, you gotta kind of handle it with grace and um, compassion. And, you know, so it was what I said was along the lines of, you know, I really, I think I may have jumped into this a little bit too soon that I really do need some work on myself that, you know, in order to give myself a hundred percent, I have to do some work. And, and that could very well be the truth, you know, in that I probably have built up some walls because of these men that have treated me poorly that um, caused some issues, you know, for, for any man, I, I would say, you know, at one point, I think this last gentleman that I've been dating, he asked me, 
you know, what, what would you say is one of your red flags? And I said, well, I don't have red flags. I may have yellow flags, <laughs> but the biggest one is, you know, the fact of my traumas with, with men in the past. It's, I do, I have a hard time being vulnerable now. It is hard to trust when you don't know exactly what caused you to fall for men who didn't have integrity, who mm -hmm. lied, who were avoidant, who had unhealthy boundaries. And so, you know, what I'm hearing over and over too is you come in and then you, you're fixing, right? You're going to fix the guy without boundaries because maybe he could have better boundaries if I only give him that chance. And the guy who's the liar is a liar. I mean, that was just, you know, unfortunate that you didn't see it right away because it's hard to know what people are lying about and what they're not. But I think part of you just wants to belong and to be loved. And it's easy to ignore and abandon yourself when you're with these men because the attraction is strong. Mm -hmm. And so when the attraction is not strong, like with this last guy, he was a nice guy. He had good communication. He was, he was kind. He had integrity. There are a lot of nice people who you will not fall in love with. There is a tendency to go from dangerous dating to safe dating, and they're both extremes. So in order to find the center, you can't abandon the things that are most important. And I think your must-have list has to become a little bit more intentional. I think that's part of the work. Really understanding your attachment style and who you're attracted to and why. Also your own temperament and the temperament of the people that are in your life and how they fit with you. And the last thing is your core limiting beliefs, the beliefs that we all have about each ourselves that limit us because people pleasing is one of them. It's the term for it is subjugation. And these all come from childhood. So we'll go through each of these and then we'll work on your list when we're done. And your values are really important. So there's so many aspects, but those are really right. the key parts of work. And once you identify the most important things and your values and the things that are important to you, then you learn how to speak up about the things that bother you and hurt you from the start. The things you have questions about, you don't just dismiss. You talk about them, you set boundaries around things that are important to you, and then you hold fast to those boundaries. That's kind of in a nutshell, <laughs> like what the work <laughs> is. A it's a lot. We're not going to cover That's good. everything That's today, good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but this is the kind of work I do with my clients. Like we look at your past and the love blueprint, how you came to be who you are today, why we are attracted to the people we are. It's hard not to be attracted to those people, but we can rewire our brains for attraction and we can learn to show up differently. So if we're having hard conversations from the start and we're asking questions that we may have been afraid to ask, those are all ways to improve our communication so that we can know from the start, is this person on the same page? Does this person have the ability to be in integrity with me? Can we grow together? Just to also go back to, can attraction grow? Attraction can grow with the right person when there is, I would say, on a scale of one to 10, there's at least a five to begin with. But this isn't just about attraction. What you're talking about is a value of yours that is not being met. The value of fitness, the value of health. You take care of your body. Often when people are severely overweight, there are other things at play, whether this person is eating emotionally because they're not expressing emotionally. There could be so many other things underlying why this person isn't motivated to take care of themselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a complicated thing. And I'm not putting down people who are overweight, but I'm saying that there is an intentionality that's important to you. And that is important for you to be aligned with in a partner. He is definitely like active though. He, you know, he does work out and he is willing to go hiking with me. You know, every weekend we would go hiking and stuff. So it's not like he, you know, sits on the couch and eats bonbons or anything like that. Okay. He, 
he is aware of that, but I, he is overweight, morbidly obese, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's one of those things, like, I don't know if you, to me, if someone told me, you know, something along those lines, like Beth, you need to lose, you know, 10 or 15 pounds, I would take, it would hurt. I mean, it would, I would hit, it would hit hard, but I, I would probably do something about it. So I don't know at what point that's, that's a harsh subject. And some people take that really badly. If you know, yeah. do you say something or do you not? Do I move on? I guess is, is the way that I looked at it. What would be important is to know if that's the only thing, because I have a feeling it's not, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. attraction mm-hmm. is dependent on many things on personality, on, on charm, on how a person shows up for you. Um, so many things and given your history of dating people who are emotionally not the right people for you, your attraction is for more dangerous people. Mm -hmm. So part of this could be the hard wiring that you need to change your wiring and maybe you will eventually fall for somebody who is not dangerous and is safer and feels more attractive to you you know, without even bringing the weight issue into the mix, because there are plenty of people. I mean, a a friend of mine was, was telling me about a guy she was dating and she said, he's the nicest guy. I just find him to be so unattractive. And I said, well, tell me more about him. She goes, well, he's really boring too. And I said, so he's (laughs) not right for you. So she goes, but he's so nice. And I think it's really rare to find nice men. Well, that's because she was married to a really abusive, emotionally Mm. abusive man. And she doesn't think niceness is common. Mm. So she goes, is it so bad to be with somebody boring? I said, that's for you to figure out. But I personally, like, it's the conversations we have every day. It's the fact that you want to have a million conversations with this person that's going to make you want to be with them not not the fact that you know he's nice that's not enough so let's back up now and t- let's talk about your love blueprint the way that your parents were were your parents divorced married? my parents are married they still are <laughs> 64 okay. years i think this this coming year um they are very loving i think as i grew up my family, I have two older sisters, my like seven years older and five years older. And then my brother is three years younger. And my brother and I were kind of like the second family. <laughs> and the first family, you know, may have gotten a different treatment than what my brother and I did. They were kind of more career oriented. And um, I played sports. So my dad, you know, I did get quite a bit of attention from my father. Um, but a lot of times I think they were more just into themselves than, than my brother and I. Yeah. No avoidant that just, just dinged for me, the avoidant (laughs) that you were attracted to, you were used to people not being really there. They were kind of in their own, doing their own thing. Right. My parents, you know, post-divorce have been the most supportive people there are. I couldn't Mm. have gotten through everything without them. So it's, Mm. you know, they, they changed too, (laughs) you know, throughout life. Yeah. That's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. So the culture in your family was that marriage was important. Obviously they stayed married a long time. Who had the power in their relationship? My father did. Yeah. He was the disciplinarian and whatever he said went and, you know, he had a pretty stressful position. So at times, you know, we would have to be you know, walking on eggshells or be very quiet, make sure everything was nice and clean and picked up. So he wouldn't, you know, blow his temper. He did have a temper at times. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, you know, I I can see some of that, you know, where my anxious attachment style came from, Mm -hmm. from definitely my childhood and my, my marriage too. Yeah. Yeah. And the people pleasing. People pleasing. Yeah. That's my whole family. My mother's a a people pleaser, you know, and, and I feel I just grew up just like her. (laughs) What can I do to help you in your life? (laughs) Kind of person. Yeah. 
so wow. helping people is lovely. And if mm. it's at the cost of your own needs and your own authenticity, it's not okay. Your parents were very involved in their own life, not because they didn't love you, but because they were busy doing whatever they life. needed to right. do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as a result, you learn to take care of yourself, but also you were always kind of worried about the other shoe dropping and you didn't want to have your father blow a gasket. So you did the right things to be, to belong in your family. And you're continuing to do that in your relationships. So that's, that's where the love blueprint comes in. And, um, and we all have it, we all have this, but we can change it. So you said anxiously attached, um, and you're, you've been attracted to avoidance in the past, right? So ultimately you want to find more secure, securely attached relationships Right. And, um, but there is that pull that somebody who is not needy, clingy is going to be more attractive than somebody who might be. And, you know, these people echo the family of origin, and then you're trying to somehow get the love and the attention you didn't get as a child through these partners, which is impossible. And right. so there's the fixing. There's the, if I only say the right thing, do the right thing, then they're somehow going to become the right partner and they don't. And so really when we fall in love, we want to fall in love with the person exactly how they are and who they are right now. Because once you go in trying to tweak whatever it is that they are, including asking somebody to lose a lot of weight, it's setting you up for failure from the start, Mm. right? I mean, people have personalities, right? They're all going to come with their own set of their background, their love blueprint, their attachment style, and they can make small shifts. Like we can shift habits, but we can't shift personality and temperament. Right. I had a guest recently on the podcast, um, Michelle Skeen, and she wrote the book, Why Can't I Let You Go? And it's all about trauma bonds and toxic relationships. And she breaks down the core limiting beliefs. And those are the things that hold us back. I'll go through all of them really quickly. The first one is abandonment. Um, many people are have this core belief. We're afraid of rejection. We're afraid that somebody's going to let us down, um, leave us. Where on a scale of one to 10, would you say abandonment is a core belief for you? 10 being high? Yeah, 10 being um, high. I would say it's a way up there. Seven, mm. eight. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What happens when you are afraid of being rejected is, again, you can abandon yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So we then, people please, then we become something else. We are a chameleon. We will do anything to make that person love us, even though it may not be the right relationship. Recognizing that fear of abandonment might, might have kept you too long in relationships is a really important step. Um, yeah. The next one, and this might also be true for you, I think, mistrust and abuse. So this is where you're afraid to trust people. It sounded like that came up a little earlier in the, our conversation. Mm-hmm. And you think people might hurt you. Um, how do you trust, right? So if you've been hurt in the past, where on a scale of one to 10 is this one for you? It's high. Eight out of 10, probably. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then this one, I think, is also going to come up pretty high for you. (laughs) It's called emotional deprivation. And it's, again, in childhood, if you weren't tended to emotionally in the ways that you needed, the way you were describing your childhood, it was a lot of doing. It was a lot of, if I'm a good girl, I'll be accepted. If I do really well in school and sports, I will get the love I need. And so that creates emotional deprivation in childhood. And then the way it looks in romantic relationships is you can feel really disconnected from people. You can um, have a deficit of emotional needs met and you can feel really lonely in a relationship. On a scale of one to 10, where do you think that falls? Probably probably seven out of 10. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
The next one is defectiveness. And that is where you blame yourself for not being loved enough. Um, maybe in childhood, it's my fault that my parents didn't love me enough. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe in relationships, you have the same thing. You carry shame. Um, you worry that your faults will be exposed. For a lot of people, they well, it could be a physical defect too for some people, um, but they carry shame about their faults, their so-called perceived faults. Where yeah. on a scale of one to 10 is that for you? Um, there's some of it, but I, I feel a lot of it. That's one thing through my therapy that I've been able to help myself with. So I, I mm -hmm. would say like five or six out of that. Okay. I, I'm yeah. able to be, you know, logically, I think through some of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And the next one's dependence. And so that one is when you grow up in a family where you're not taught to be self-reliant. You're taught to rely on your parents for everything. And then you get into relationships where you rely on your partner and end up in codependent relationships. Um, scale of one to 10 on dependence. Okay. Um, that's the same thing for that. That's something, you know, that I, you know, during my marriage, possibly very high number, but since then through therapy, I would say about five out of 10, maybe. Okay. Yeah. I had a feeling. And yeah. then the last one is failure and that's a need to be perfect. Um, you feel like a failure. You compare yourself to other people. You feel less than you feel like you're not doing enough. You're not measuring up a scale of one to 10. Where is that? Um, that's low for me. It really okay. is. I don't, and even with the relationships, I, I don't see it as a failure. You know, mm -hmm. it's a lesson, a lesson yeah. learned. Um, I would say maybe two, two out of 10. Okay. Oh, very low. Okay. Yeah. So the top ones are subjugation, the people pleasing, putting other people first. That's a big one. And mm -hmm. abandonment, fear of abandonment and mistrust and abuse we're really mistrust i would say and awesome. emotional deprivation those are those are the big ones for you sounds about right yeah so we all carry these and the way to work through them is to think about how what you do when you fear abandonment think about what you do when you don't trust and so a lot of us self-sabotage, like we, when we're afraid of abandonment, we become people pleasers. When we're afraid that we can't trust somebody, we put walls up, right? Those are coping mechanisms. And right. so learning different ways to cope by saying, okay, I don't trust easily, but what will I do differently this time? So you mentioned dating with intentionality. That's a great thing to do. It's a really important thing to do. But what does that look like? And so I heard part of your list. Tell me a little bit more about dating with intentionality and what that looks like for you. Well, it, it more this time was like the first date. Most people are pretty nervous. I'm, I'm actually very I think it's just because of my profession. I'm able to make people feel a little bit at ease. So, you know, the first date though, is you just don't get that true feeling for the person. So, you know, if they ask me for a second date, I always give them a second date. So then that's where I feel like I can really get an idea of where they're at, who they are, what are their goals? Are they matching with mine, their values, you know, and every now and then I'll throw in a question about, you know, just to check integrity type of thing, because it's important to me. It's super important. I, I want to know that it's a man that I can trust. And of course, you know, people can lie and, and mislead you, but I feel you get a good feel for somebody, you know, if you believe them or not what they're saying. So I think, um, well, what's an example of a question you might ask? So I, you know, the one gentleman, I asked him straight up, he was talking about, he says, well, give me any question you got, go ahead. And I said, have you ever cheated on anyone that you've been in a committed relationship with? And he said, yes, he did, that he had cheated on his wife. And that just, I felt everything in my body, just my heart rate go up, my face get red. He, he knew right away that that was not something I wanted to hear, but yet I knew. 
this was something not in line with me. Um, you know, I, not that you should be held accountable for one mistake that you made for the rest of your life, but at the same time, why would I want to take that risk? You know, unless there was something weighing, you know, like, oh, he's got everything else, just this one thing, I may have been able to look past that and work with him on that. But because there were some other things too, he too was not a healthy man. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't give him the third date, you know, so right. that type of intention, I guess, mm -hmm. I want to know that they're a man of integrity. So, yeah. What else would you ask a man to learn how integritous he is? Um, just things about like their, you know, their past relationships, how, how were things, you know, how did things end? Are you so cordial with that person? You know, that, that too, you know, the way that they talk about their exes, you know, we all have people that you, you may not want to ever talk to again, but is that what you're going to say? Like, oh, she was horrible. And, you know, I'm so glad she's out of my life. You know, I always think of, okay, that could be me in four months, you know? So it's another, it's integrity to be able to think back at one point you cared about this person. So you're going to talk highly of them. So that too is a, is a, good indicator for me. Um, and then of course, just their overall, how they, how they feel about their children. What, what kind of relationship do they have with their, with their friends, with their family, that type of thing, you know, it's, are you true to yourself and what are, you know, goals and stuff like that too. Do you have goals? Or are you just here hoping to, to hook up with somebody, you know? So mm -hmm. So you ask yeah. their relationship goals and mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yes, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, and what their end goal is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Most people take it very well from, from my perspective, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's important to know all these things. The way you ask a question can change how somebody answers and mm. getting examples of things would be probably good for you. Like asking people what they learned since their last relationship ended. Oh, sure. That makes sense. Um, asking what they're looking for that might be different from something they looked for in the past, you know, and then sharing yours because you want to know that somebody has a growth mindset, that they're learning and growing, that they're not stuck. Um, I've asked people what kind of relationship you're looking for and they go, I don't know, um, I guess a girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> nobody's ever asked me I'm like come on <laughs> they, they ask it online in your profile like on, on you know right. on the apps so yeah you learn a lot about people but so much is learned through how they respond to stress how they respond to your issues are they good listeners all those things so let's let's talk about your list a little more you mentioned kindness before how you treat the, the wait staff and um, you know, anyone you come in contact with and has your back. What does that look like to you? Just somebody who doesn't need to be told what I need, <laughs> you know, as far as I'm, I'm a very independent person because of, you know, what has happened to me throughout my life. But at the same time, I would love for somebody to be able to come, you know, and like when I'm not feeling well to like, Hey, you know, would you like some soup or do you need me to get you anything? You know what I mean? Cause I'm not a type of person who will ask for help, but if you're supplying it without me asking, that's fantastic. That's a very attractive quality to me. All right. Let's address this for a minute. Okay. <laughs> I see you to tweet on that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, people are really bad at mind reading. And yeah, I know <laughs> and asking for help is vulnerable, but mm -hmm. it is, yeah. it's also part of the profile of a people pleaser. I do for others, mm -hmm. but I will not ask anyone to do anything for me. And if they love me, they would know. Right. And that is a fallacy. <laughs> it's, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's, it's, it is part of me not being vulnerable. Yeah. To ask for help and then have somebody say no. No is good information. No is going to tell you if a person can be there and have your back. But if right. you don't ask, you don't know. 
And so I want to give that to you for homework. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ask for help. <laughs> ask for help. Don't assume. <laughs> yeah. Always ask for what you want. Um, okay. Don't assume anything. And, and that includes um, coming on time for a date. That includes if somebody offers to take you on a date that you don't want to go on, that you speak up right away and say, thank you so much for suggesting that. That sounds like a wonderful third or fourth date, but not a first date for me. And I would love to meet you for coffee or a walk or a smoothie for a first date. How does that work for you? So it's asking for what you want, not just help, but asking for what you want. And the more you do that from the beginning, the more you're going to be in a relationship with somebody who actually you'll know whether they can provide you with what you want. Interrupting people when they talk too much, asking them if there's anything that they want to know about you, even if they're <laughs> nervous, but you tolerating and just being the good listener and the nurse and the caring, compassionate person that works in the hospital but it, you know, or at the doctor's office, but it doesn't work in relationships because right, it's two right. people providing for each other. And you want someone who has your back. You've got to have your back. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. So honesty is going to be something that you're going to see over time. You're going to ask questions. You're going to see if they, you know, if their stories line up, you'll pay attention to that. Somebody who cares about their health and fitness is important to you. That's, that's one of your values. Communication, you said, was one of your values. Yes. Most importantly is how you want to feel. How do you want um, to feel when you're with the right man? Happy that I'm there with them. I want to have that chemistry that I'm, I want to kiss you type feeling, you know, like I, that, as opposed to, you know, this past time when I dated with intention, I had so many men, nice men, I just did not have that attraction. I, I just friendly. That's all. Um, so I definitely want that chemistry to be there. Somebody, you know, you, I can laugh with and, and feel safe to be vulnerable. I guess I'm able to let my walls down. You know, I think that's what I want. Let's talk about safety because that's a big one safe to be vulnerable and vulnerabilities come up a lot today. So mm -hmm. let's focus on that. In order to feel safe to be vulnerable, who does he have to be? I'm not sure, to be honest. In my past, I trusted these men that, that were not faithful or whatever happened in each one. It's So it's hard. I think each one, I put up a little bit more of a defense <laughs> like I'm you're gonna get to right here and I don't I don't know yet I guess that's something definitely I need to work on is what makes a man worthy enough to have my walls come down for them in order to trust certain things have to be there right not a hundred chances but certain things have to be there so words and actions have to match correct he does what he says he's gonna do he shows up he Correct. is there for you. He, uh, when you make a request, which you haven't done a lot of lately, but when you make a request, he is able to either meet your request or tell you what he can do instead, right? These are ways that partnerships are developed slowly over time. Right. Safety and trust have to be earned. Stories have to be earned our stories about our past, about the hard things in our lives, we don't share them right away because that's a boundary crossing. And when somebody shares with us all of the hard, deeper, darker secrets and their illnesses and everything on the first date, that's a boundary crossing. It's too much too soon. And so we don't trust people who do that. That's That for me would be a deal breaker. Like, you're okay. telling me too much. You're identifying with your illness. You're identifying with a victim mindset. No, this is not, this is who you are. That's fine. And I'm going to walk away. And okay. so being more true to you and having your back, you have your back, right? right. So what do right. I need to have my back? 
I need to be more discerning. You're dating with discernment, but even more. So increasing discernment looks like I don't trust people until they've earned my trust. I don't share my body, my stories, my deeper, darker secrets, my goodwill, my meals, my things that I make and want to give them and shower them with gifts and do all these nice things. They have to earn that. They have to show me that they're investing in the relationship in their, with time, with money, with actions. These are all ways that we learn to trust people consistency over time okay makes sense you date somebody a few times you decide okay this person's already told me something that's they're off the list goodbye no more chances <laughs> all right <laughs> i am not turned on at all no more chances like i am turned off no more chances they've lied to me because what they said last time and this time don't don't line up they don't have a good relationship with their children no more chances. They are already showing me they have poor boundaries. No more chances. So you're going to give less chances. And you're also going to not abandon yourself. So whatever you want from a man, you've got to take care of for yourself. You've got to have your own back. You have to improve your communication. It means you have to ask for help. You have to speak up. You have to set boundaries. You have to let men know this doesn't work for me. Really nice to meet you. I'm going to move on. Or if something happens and you've been dating for a bit, you bring up the issue the minute it happens. Somebody starts communicating with you less often. You bring it up. Yeah, that's, that is something that I've been working on. Good. Tell me what you are taking away so far, because I've shared a lot with you. <laughs> lots, yes. Um, well, I have lots to work on. And, and here I thought I've been in therapy for five and a half years. I should be good to go. But clearly there's still, of course, making sure that I have my own back and making some clear values, what I'm expecting out of men that I want to date, being more specific with some of that well there's quite a bit you know as far as with the trust and mistrust and the fear of abandonment and emotional deprivation stuff like that those are all things that i can work on you know that are tangible things that i can do lots to work on that's good mm -hmm. it's all good stuff who would have ever thought that finding your love is so hard i mean i just <laughs> it's it's blows me away at times but it will be worth it, I hope, in the end. So I'd like to reframe this a little bit. I don't believe that this is just about finding a partner. I believe this is about finding ourselves, yeah. finding the parts of ourselves that we've abandoned, the parts of ourselves that are wounded. And those parts are going to benefit us no matter whether we find a partner or not. We right. will be more in alignment with who we really are meant to be, with our true selves, and that will change every relationship you have at work, at home, with your children, with your parents. You'll have probably less people in your life who are very close to you, but you'll have more honest, open relationships because you will have accessed your true nature, right. not the nature of you that became that adapted as a little, little you, little Beth adapted mm -hmm. to survive. And now it's all about thriving. So to me, this is raising awareness and knowing the steps to take. It's a clear path to a, a more joyous life, you know, no matter what happens. Right, right. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, thank you. Your homework is to start speaking up more, asking for help. Don't assume things about people. Ask more clarifying questions even, you know, really be more specific about what you need and want in a partner and work on those tendencies, the core limiting beliefs where you find yourself fearing abandonment, fearing rejection, distrusting, subjugating, and ask yourself, like, what am I doing because of these core limiting beliefs? How am I coping and how can I 
what can I do differently? It's just really, really important to do this work and it, it'll it change everything. You'll have less doubt about whether you left the wrong, you know, left the right partner and know that there are other people out there. You know, your, your body was telling you this wasn't the right fit, whether it's his weight or something else. It sounds like it was not just the fact that he was a bigger person, but something else was there. And something was missing for you. And the more, the more you do this work, the more clarity you'll have that this is working. This isn't, and here's why. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Really appreciate you coming on the show and and thank you for having me. Yeah. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. It's been very my absolute <laughs> my pleasure. I'm glad it was helpful. And yeah. to our listeners, thank you so much for listening. And if you love our show, please give us a high rating and review on Apple Podcasts and share this episode with your friends if you think they will benefit. Follow the show you, wherever you listen to podcasts. We're on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple, wherever you find podcasts. And as always, Here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. 